For this flat iron stinging tech tip, we're going to talk about oil. It's probably one of the very first things that, uh, that any enthusiast looks at when they're looking at uh, doing an oil change for their car. And it can be probably one of the most confusing aspects of, of your car's performance and, and trying to pick an oil, make sure that you've got the right one. There's a lot of different information out there. It's very confusing. And it's really hard to know how one oil compares to another. Um, are all synthetics the same? So on and so forth. So, what we wanted to do, we've got a ton of questions over the years. We wanted to try and give you at least a, a baseline uh, to kind of know what some of the differences are, some of the things to look at. And then there's one thing that's come up pretty recently that is a really good point of information that isn't discussed nearly maybe as much as it should be, which is uh, relevant to how the American Petroleum Institute or API standards affect what additive packages in your oil. Um, but to start, you know, if you're, if you're looking at different oils, there's the first defining factor is conventional versus synthetic. Um, at this point, synthetics are very widely available, they're very widely marketed, and it's pretty clear, you know, if you have an oil that is a synthetic versus a conventional. So then, as I said, one of the first questions you, you start to ask is, well, are all synthetics the same? And the simple answer is no, and for a pretty basic reason, which is that under the group of synthetic oils, there's actually two different kinds of bases, two different kinds of base oils that, that a manufacturer would start with. That's a group four and a group five. Um, so that in and of itself can be a differentiator between one type of oil and another. Um, group four oils are PAO, or poly-alpha olefin oils, if I got that anywhere close. And group five oils are ester-based oils. The ester base is probably, probably the hardest to find or least common. It's the most expensive, um, and I would call it probably the highest grade of a synthetic oil. Um, but again, both of them are a synthetic base, and that's one differentiating factor between the, the types. The next thing to look at is what, other than the base oil, what additive packages, what other components are put into the oil. And that's where things get really confusing. Um, if you're out there and you're looking around, probably the first additive or first thing that people will, will, will pop up uh, or find is zinc uh, and or zinc and phosphorus. Um, it's widely discussed with flat type of V8s, but because of their similar valve train layout, Subaru engines also get thrown into the mix quite often with, with the discussion about zinc and, and the desire to have the high zinc and high zinc and phosphorus content oil if you're running those kinds of engines. And that's, a, that's the one that's been one of the more tricky things to find lately. And what's been going on, uh, that, that's the point that we wanted to make about the API standards. Lately. So what's been going on in the background that hasn't been discussed maybe as much as it should, is that the API, or American Petroleum Institute, works with car manufacturers to come out with standards of oil. Um, and where, where zinc and phosphorus are related to all this is that if your car is burning any amount of oil, yeah, the zinc and phosphorus, if they get through the, the combustion chamber and out into the catalytic converter, they can shorten catalytic converter life. So what's been happening is as uh, car manufacturers are being required to warranty catalytic converters for longer and longer amounts of time. They've been working with the American Petroleum Institute to reduce the parts per million content of zinc and phosphorus in the oils to try and help ensure that even if a car were you know, to send a little bit of oil out through the exhaust, it's not going to have a significant effect on the catalytic converter life. And so what's been happening over the last 10 plus years is that the parts per million content of zinc and phosphorus in the API standard oils has been going down. It's not gone, it's just been more and more limited as time has gone on. And so again, where this gets confusing is what that potentially means is if you're using an API certified oil today that you were using 10 years ago, what's in the bottle is probably not the same, and what, the, what is blended in there is probably similar, but not the same as what it was 10 years ago. And in fact, it may have changed a couple of times uh, in that 10-year in that period. So that's where it becomes really almost hard to know, like, is the oil that I'm getting today the same, and is it going to, you know, if I, if I want high zinc and phosphorus contents, am I going to have that now as opposed to before? And so what we did is we reached out to all the manufacturers of the oil that we carry, which are represented on the table here, uh, Motul, Redline, Driven, Schaefer's, to try and, you know, kind of get, get more of a baseline or more information to, to make a choice in, in finding an oil with a high zinc and phosphorus content, if that's what you're looking for. And one of the key points that came out was that not every oil has to be API certified. Um, it turns out if, if oil is produced in small batches, 
um, for motorsports use, off-road use, or if the manufacturer just doesn't want to submit it for API approval or current API approval, it doesn't have to. And so from that standpoint, if you want higher zinc and phosphorus content in your oils, what the, the takeaway was, well, if it's an API certified oil, then that's going to be a bit of a moving target you know, now and going forward. But if it's not an API certified oil with that content in mind, then you know, probably those contents are going to be higher, so it's going to be more likely to meet you know, the zinc and phosphorus content that you're looking for, but it's also going to likely be more consistent um, year after year because it's not going to be changing as the API standards change. Um, and certainly with any oil, if there's any questions as far as what exactly is in it, what you want to find is a current oil analysis done on a new sample. Um, or you could send the oil out yourself to find out exactly what additive package is, is in it. Um, so that in mind, it turns out that all the oils here are not submitted or blended to meet the current API standard, um, or that current API standard. Um, they're, they're, and they're all blended to have um, higher content of zinc and phosphorus. And, and so as you start to go through them, we just want to kind of walk through the list of the oils we carry, explain what some of the differences are. And, you know, hopefully that com compared with kind of understanding what's going on with the API gives you a good baseline of information to help pick the oil that you're looking for. Um, so Schaefer's, um, that is a group four base oil with also group three, but a sufficient quant quantity of group four that is considered as a uh, full synthetic oil. Um, then we have Driven, that is a full group four oil, so it's a PAO and MPAO base in, in, in entirely. Um, Redline is the first one that is a, has some ester base. It's, uh, I believe it's more than half ester base, but it's ester in, or grade four and group five base oil. Uh, and then we have Motul. Motul is an interesting one. As of all the manufacturers here, they're probably the biggest uh, oil manufacturer. And they have a couple different offerings. In their 8100 group, that, that's the one that is, was really fascinating to finally like delve down into and figure out what's going on with that. Um, they have a lot of different blends. Uh, when you're talking about zinc and phosphorus, Motul can, considers that SAPS, or refers to it as SAPS, which stands for, for sulfuric ash, sulfur, and phosphorus. Um, they have full SAPS, mid SAPS, and low SAPS blends all in the 8100 group. So if you want high zinc and phosphorus content, there's actually, you know, that would be their full SAPS blend, but that is different. Um, then the other two, they do have you know, some 8100 that meets the current API certification. So there's a lot of different choices in that grouping. Um, these two, again, the, the Ecoenergy and the Excess are from the, the full SAPS group. And the interesting thing that Motul does is they work very closely with manufacturers to meet other standards, not necessarily just the API standard with, with this 8100. So um, like the 540, for instance, meets uh, the BMW LL01 standard, uh, Porsche 840, uh, Volkswagen 502 and 505 standard, um, and they do, again, Motul does a lot of work with auto manufacturers to meet the, these other standards other than just an API standard here in America. So there's a lot of choices there with the 8100, and then when we get to the 300V, which is what most people can most think of with Motul and synthetics, that is the only full ester-based oil on the table. But this is a full-on motorsports blended oil. Um, this is designed for high temperature, high abuse, um, high stress use. It's something where if you're doing a lot of track days, you can probably do two or three track days a month and you know, only have to change your oil every month or two. Um, really it's designed to provide the highest grade of protection for a short period of time rather than a good, grade of, good amount of protection for a long period of time. Um, but that's, that's the difference between all of these. And so like with any of these, because they're not, these are designed to have certain packages in them. They're not designed to go necessarily long, long duration. If you're looking for an oil to go long distance between changes, um, and this is pretty much universally applicable, is you'd want to go to your normal change interval, somewhere between three and 4,000 miles, then do an oil analysis, and then follow that up with subsequent oil analysis about every 1,000 miles to make sure that the oil is still providing sufficient protection uh, before it would need to be replaced. And one of the interesting points that the guys from Driven made when we were talking about their oil and stuff is that um, visually, too, a lot of these oils, um, as they get hot, as they see high temperature use, they will turn dark in color or black and get to the point where almost you can't see through them. And that's um, characterization, in some cases, of oxidation of the oil, which might indicate that um, 
it would be time to change or maybe not providing as good a protection as it did when it was brand new. Um, so that'd be another criteria, just to visually look at your oil and then change it once it starts to get really dark in color. Um, but of course to be sure, you know, really with, with anything oil, if you want to be exactly sure of what's in the bottle, the only way to know for absolute sure is to do an oil analysis yourself or find someone that's done analysis of that oil recently. Um, and same thing for, for changing, like if you're going to try and change it or, uh, extend your change intervals, you've got to do the testing to make sure that the oil that you're using is going to stand up to whatever life you're, you're wanting to get out of it. So, again, hopefully that gives you some criteria and hopefully it cuts through some of the confusion, especially in, in regards to why one oil would be different or significantly different than another. Um, and what those, some of those differences are with synthetic oils. So, thanks very much for watching. Hopefully you found this helpful. Um, if you liked the video, please drop a like and stay tuned for more Flatiron Studio Tech Tips.